Okay, it is now 11 o'clock. Um, it's 11 o'clock and this is Tamara Sale. Um, we have on the line with us uh, our presenters from Webinar 1, uh, Dr. Neil Falk and Dr. Nev Jones, and then we're trying to get Ryan Melton on the line, who is going to be the presenter on Webinar 2. You'll have plenty of additional time to spend with him um, during our um, upcoming webinar and then afterward, but we're hoping to, that he can join us. He's having uh, some technological issues. Um, so it looks like we have a, a significantly smaller group today, which is good. Uh, we have um, 21 individuals, um, and if you, um, if you have specific questions, uh, for those of you who are on the computer screen, um, you can post those under Q&A or chat. Um, we may need to ask people to mute their lines um, you know, when you're not speaking, just so that we don't get um, echoes and that sort of thing. So if people are having difficulty with, with echoing or, or not being able to hear, um, let us know um, in the chat, probably. Um, so, and I, I am hearing some background noise, so I think there's probably at least one person who can, um, okay, so now Bill, Bill Bain is saying that he can't hear anyone. Um, I see him as, there's a little green arrow <coughs> next to him, so I'm thinking he may be muted now. Okay. All right, so uh, we have an hour and a half scheduled, um, and uh, we have 28, 29 people now on, 30, 30 people on the line now, so uh, that might be just a few too many for us to do a lot of personal introduction, but maybe what we could do is when you ask your question, if you could introduce yourself um, and just tell us a little bit about uh, where you're from and um, the kind of the current status of your community, and then move into the the question that you have to um, to ask. Um, and let's see. Feel free if you want to type the question in the Q and A or chat. Um, we can answer it that way, or the lines at this point are all open, so um, people can go ahead and. Um, and ask questions. And if people don't start asking questions, then we will probably start asking you questions and ask you to introduce yourselves. So with that, uh, do we have anybody who wants to start us off with a question? Okay, so I'm hearing a conversation which is not ours, I think. So, all right, so I'm going to, um, can everybody hear us? Let me ask you that first. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Great. Okay, and um, is there anyone else who wants to, is there anyone who wants to start off with a question? We've got somebody who's typing here. And I see that we have a, a mixture of um, a few folks from Oregon um, who I know have just recently started new programs or are in the process of starting new programs. And then we have folks from all over the country, um, kind of an interesting mixture actually. Um, okay, well, if, if I, if nobody volunteers a question, I am going to just, oh, here we go, here's a question. <laughs> You're off the hook. Okay, understanding that most states have silos, how do you implement interventions that work with both youth and young adults? Um, that's a really great question, and um, 
you know, Jewel, what state are you from? <laughs> Georgia, okay. Um, so, you know, Oregon, like every state, has plenty of silos. Um, there are some which are, you know, have their own unique um, silos, like um, New York probably is the, the worst of all states for silos. Um, you know, and our state maybe is not quite as bad just because we're smaller. Um, what we've done is, you know, the, our our state organization that is um, overseeing the implementation is um, housed in the Children and Family Unit, um, but they've created a, a transition age youth um, component of that. And then most of the integration that happens is actually more at the local provider level. So what's happened is that uh, the, the local teams, in the way that we've constructed them, are all um, required to serve both teenagers and young adults within the same team. So typically, in all of our programs, um, each of the providers on the team is able to serve both of um, both ages. So uh, that creates um, maybe an illusion of seamlessness, um, but from the perspective of the, the teenagers and young adults, it, it does end up being, um, uh, being a, a seamless thing. Um, it's required a certain amount of kind of working through, you know, differences and procedures and, and that sort of thing, and it, it, it comes up periodically as an issue for prescribers who don't feel comfortable going outside of um, their current scope of practice. Um, you know, so it's, it's something that we continue to problem solve and, and work with people on. Um, but at an agency level, you have to make a decision about where within your agency you're going to place the program for supervision. And some have, um, some have chosen to place it in an ad adult, under an adult side, and some have chosen to place it under a, a children's side, and some have chosen uh, to create a whole new infrastructure for transition age youth, which probably is ultimately what you're shooting for. Um, you know, so depending on what you're starting with, uh, you know, you, you know it, it just depends on, on which agency. Can you say more about your transition teams and the level of support from the state? Um, so when um, we can, first started, yeah, gonna, yeah uh huh. Sorry, sorry, just to jump in on the other one. Um, so in in the webinar, and we were drawing a lot on. Um, ESA's experiences and the way ESA is structured, which is maybe not absolutely ideal, but has a lot of strength. So I just wanted to chip in that in California, where I'm based, I mean, there, there continue to be a lot of issues in terms of silos even reproduced within the early intervention system. So for instance, we have some counties, and you have to be a living in a particular county to access county-based services, you might have just the prodromal, count, um, prodromal program and then no first episode program, and then you go a county north and you have no prodromal program and you suddenly have a first episode program and people are actually making up addresses to end up in the right county to be able to access services at different times. So, I, so my only point would be at a systems level to really think about that from the get-go in terms of how do you structure these services so that you're not going to create even sort of yet more silos in addition to those that are already existing or sort of segregated programs and accessing and coordination problems. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. Um, let's see, now I'm, I'm hearing that some folks have lost, Julie, Jewel lost audio, um, and then Ming was having difficulty speaking. Um, let's see. Um, so if you're having audio issues, please click meeting in the right-hand corner and then go through the audio setup. Okay, good. Jewel, you're back. <laughs> Since we're answering your question, I thought that would be kind of important for you to be on the phone. Okay, so yeah, so Nev was just making the point that silos generally are a big issue, um, and to the degree that you can get consistency across your state, you know, if you've got multiple programs, 
so that people are doing things in a, in a, a similar kind of fashion, um, it, it makes it a little bit less arbitrary and a lot easier to coordinate. Um, in terms of the youth adult um, uh, integration, uh, that's definitely a very important part. Um, we, we actually started out with everything in the adult system, and now a lot of, a lot of the work is being done more under the children's side. Um, you, you talked about, let's see, Jill asked a follow-up question about can you say more about your transition teams and the level of support from the state. Um, so um, all of our local ESA programs, and you know, now I'm speaking specifically about ESA, um, are um, at the, you know, they have um, certain disciplines that all come together on a team that um, in some cases um, is co-located, that's our preference, but at a minimum they meet together on a weekly basis. They have shared uh, treatment plans that they work off of. Um, they all include um, the, um, a, an LMP, um, most often a psychiatrist, but sometimes a prescribing nurse. Um, they have um, counselors. We, we encourage kind of an integration of counseling and case management into one function. Um, we have uh, supported employment specialists. We have occupational therapists, nurses, and we have um, peer support on most of the teams at this point in time. Um, we have a, a position at the state that focuses on both the um, uh, both transition age youth generally and ESA specifically. That position was created as part of uh, the state appropriation that led to the original dissemination. And that the person in that position, Jean Lassiter, is is extremely helpful to us because part of her role is uh, helping us when we run into some of those kinds of silo issues where there may be regulations or um, you know, billing issues or you know, data system issues or um, things that are inconsistent around what's being expected by folks at the state level. Um, so I can't say that you know, we figured it all out, but what we have is an ongoing process of um, identifying what those concerns are and continuing to work to resolve them as they come up. Um, so I'm happy to talk further with uh, Jewel or anyone else who is um, you know, trying to work through those kinds of issues. Um, it really comes down to a question of where is it going to fit best in your, given your particular scenario, um, who has the passion, the expertise, um, is best positioned for it. Um, and you know, we can share with you what various programs have done because there's not a single solution to this and, and what we would see as the advantages and disadvantages of, of those solutions that people have come up with. Um, so that was a great question. Thank you. I think Ryan is still trying to join us unsuccessfully, so we may, may not have him. Hopefully we will. Um, let's see. What are the benefits of starting in an adult system versus a child system? Um, yeah, this is a good question for us to um, even come back to and, and maybe get some different, different opinions. Um, I think that you know, the adult system generally is much more used to the evidence-based practices that are involved. Um, the, they're, they're more consistent with the, um, the normal practice of the agency. Um, they um, are more used to psychosis generally. Uh, the child system often has, uh, folks often have very little experience with psychosis. Uh, they are more used to working with families. Um, they're, they're a little bit more adept at some of the educational kinds of issues and the developmental issues. Um, so you know there are actually some significant trade-offs on both sides, and you know ultimately, you know the, the optimal thing for a team would be to have people from both backgrounds on the team, but who are extending their practice to be able to serve both. And the the one thing that you can be sure of is that every person on your team will have deficits in their training. So you'll want to look at um, what kinds of of um, knowledge 
people need to gain that they don't currently have. So for the children's folks, it might be a lot around differential diagnosis and psychosis. And for the adult people, it might be more around how to work with school systems and IEPs and 504s and, and that kind of thing. Um, so that's a pretty general question or answer to, to your question. And you know, again, we can, we can spend some more time on those things. And Tamara, if I could throw in one advantage that I've noticed in the team that I'm working in in Portland, um, because we started in the adult system of care, it makes a big difference, I think, when we're graduating people from our program, in that when we're trying to find a good program to hand them off to, we have more awareness of what's in the adult system. Uh, if the uh, team is based in the child system, it has the stereotypical problem the child system has with transitioning people into the adult system. Um, so again, that awareness, I think, has paid off quite a number of times. Um, and this is Naz. Just to, just to throw out another consideration is um, that part of this decision may end up having to do with um, where, the, where the end point in terms of age for a particular program um, ends up being placed. So some programs, in, like in the UK, for example, it's standard to go up to the age of 35. Um, in the United States, it's kind of all over the place, I think, in terms of how far individual programs um, choose to extend that. Sometimes it's you know, quite early, like 22, 23 years old. Um, obviously, if you're, if you're kind of at a, at a higher age, age range, then it probably starts to make a lot more sense to be primarily based in the adult system. And that actually introduces a whole host of issues which we probably don't have time in, to get into now, but that I think are really important in terms of, um, I want to say sort of older, young, or emerging adults, maybe let's say past the age of 25, who were initially developing a first episode of psychosis. And that's a substantial number of people. Um, and I think that's something that still probably needs to be thought through in terms of um, how to best serve them, different types of models in which they're combined with um, you know, youth under the age of 18, maybe as young as 12, or whether things are partitioned off in some other way. Um, but so those are all all issues that that a new program would need to think through. Yeah, you you definitely have a lot of kind of internal program design issues, especially as you start doing groups and and that sort of thing. You know, where like, when we do multifamily groups, typically we we have kind of age specific multifamily groups, um, and that's something that you can talk more about on the, the uh, next webinar. Um, and you know, I think that probably the most important thing to understand about these teams is that they have to be well integrated into the whole service delivery system. So if you have a team that's starting out of the child side, they need to have a really strong uh, link to the adult crisis system. Um, which they may not have at all. So they'll probably need some facilitation for how that's going to happen. Um, you know, so the, the supervisor who's, who's overseeing the program either needs to have those connections already so they can help facilitate them, or they need to be brought into those, um, those kinds of systems. And it, again, likewise, if, if it f falls down more on the adult system, um, the team may really struggle with how to get out to the high schools, but you probably have somebody else within your system who's making those linkages already. And so th there's a lot of partnering that has to happen very intentionally, and it takes a lot of management support for that to happen, because otherwise the members of the team don't actually even know what their opportunities are. Um, so I'm looking at a question from Ming. Um, using the OnTrack USA tool to estimate the prevalence of first episode psychosis, most community mental health centers in Utah cannot support a full FEP team. How do you start developing capacity in these centers so they have capacity to treat when young people with early psychosis are identified and needing services, keeping in mind that in rural areas numbers are small? That is a really great question, and um, I'm also going to suggest that we, we bring that one up um, with Lisa Dixon on webinar three. Um, we're still working through our answer to that. Um, in fact, I think we have Amanda Bunger on the line, who's our Eastern Oregon coordinator, um, you know, the, 
what I've generally recommended for any rural community, um, if you're trying to get a team started, is that you um, you try to identify one clinician who's going to um, be available 0.2 FTE at a minimum uh, to cover a whole range of functions. Um, and so what you end up with is a pretty integrated function um, with a very you know, a, a small level of FTE. And then the other piece that's really critical is the clinical supervision, that you, you really have to have somebody who is committed to continuing to ask, okay, how is this working? Um, you know, are we doing the community yet? Are we getting referrals? Are they getting to the person? You know, and, and really problem solving. Um, also, you know, integrating across functions. So again, you know, if you can think about, um, well, maybe this fits into your existing ACT team, or maybe this fits into um, a broader transition age youth kind of program, um, or you know, maybe there's a person who you know, specializes in a particular way that gives them a little bit more flexibility to be, you know, provide intensive support. Um, you know, so the rural question is um, really, really important. And I think the, the fact that it's based on kind of an ACT standard of care um, really creates some, some need for ongoing dialogue for us, I think, as a country, about how we can support people in those situations. So right now, you know, we're working with counties like Kearney County, um, Oregon, um, Wallowa County, counties that have um, incidence rates that are low enough that we would expect one person every two years. And so obviously, those folks are not going to have the like one clinician sitting there you know, just waiting for that one person to arrive every two years. So what, what, what Amanda is working on is developing a regional structure where the, you've got clinicians who are um, educated enough, um, kind of an ongoing, more intensive effort that's more focused across counties, um, and then providing the, a, you know, some additional hand-holding and support as people come into those programs recognizing that the clinicians are not going to be as immersed in the ongoing care. So the Multnomah County team obviously is very, very immersed every day. That's all they do. Whereas in Wallowa County, you know, there's going to be the one teenager who's gotten psychotic in, in 2006. And so it really does require a, a very different response. And I think as a country, we're really just beginning to figure that out. Um, so there's another question about, um, have you noticed any cultural issues in treating early psychosis? Oh my gosh, uh, that is um, absolutely yes. And Neil, I think you might be, Neil and Nev, you guys might have uh, some good insights into that one. Yeah, part of my problem in answering this question is I'm trying to think, gosh, where do I start? Because there are <laughs> so many potential cultural issues that have come up. Um, what, the first time we really addressed this on the Multnomah County team here in Portland is we have a graduation picnic every summer where we honor the people who have graduated over the course of the year, and we invite alumni, we invite current participants, we invite families, etc. And we realized that uh, despite the fact that we have, uh, it's either a quarter or a third of our clientele is African American, none of them were showing up. And we were wondering, well, why is that? And that started a whole discussion and I don't think we've come to a good answer as to why that is. Um, part of the issue may be that I think, especially in Portland, uh, the African American community is quite small and might be a bit more insular, and minority communities traditionally have an informal support network for treating individuals who have mental health symptoms. So we're wondering if our penetration into that community is not as good as we think it is. Um, I'm trying to think other cultural issues. Uh, we're, one of our latest intakes uh, is Muslim from an Arabic family uh, from Saudi Arabia does not speak English. And we're just trying to come to terms of uh, the spiritual component of his psychosis, or I should say his personality. We don't know him all that well. And we're trying to figure how much is delusional spirituality, how much is appropriate spirituality. 
Um, and when we run into these cultural issues, one thing we try to do is find someone in the mental health field who knows that culture well, preferably as part of that culture. We have a, a wonderful person at the county I work in who's not connected with our ESA program, but is Palestinian, who's helped me numerous times with people who come from the Middle East. Uh, we have an African-American uh, case manager or therapist, I should say, on our team um, that we use also for cultural consultation. Uh, Nev, feel free to chime in here, because I'm coming up, I think, with more questions than answers. And I think Ryan <laughs> also has now joined us. So. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, I would just say um, that, that cultural issues, um, you know, ethnic, racial, minority issues, socioeconomic issues as well, span pretty much every area of program development, service delivery, as well as the actual experiences in terms of symptomatology that people are having, the sort of the expectations and attitudes that their families are bringing, that their communities are bringing, that maybe their faith-based communities as well as ethnic racial communities are bringing. Um, and, and of course, that's going to vary around the United States and depending on the region. So I mean, I think my overall advice would be to just be very proactive um, if, if a new program is being set up about really figuring out um, who is likely to be referred, who is likely to be included in the catchment area, um, reaching out to communities, to minority communities early on, creating community connections in terms of faith-based leaders and maybe ethnic racial minority um, specific or focused um, youth organizations, et, et cetera. Um, and the other thing to be aware of there is, of course, what sort of um, cultural um, attitudes and expectations the clinicians in the program are bringing. Um, because I think often it's a matter of really figuring out the, the dynamics that end up um, being created between the treating clinicians and the clients and their families. So um, we could say, probably all of us could say a lot more about any one of those specific issues and what um, cultural issues might come up. Um, yeah. But just in, in sweeping strokes, that's what I would say. Yeah. And the other thing is I'm thinking this question through more to throw in is I always ask uh, people, uh, whether they're from my culture or a different culture at the first intake, how do you interpret what has happened to you? Um, and then try to work within their understanding of the illness, be that cultural-based or another belief-based, and then try to treat within that belief system. Uh, for example, we had a client who graduated a couple years ago who was Pakistani. Um, and had a, a belief system in medicine that was based in that culture, we tried to access it as much as we could. Locally, uh, he actually went and visited family in Pakistan for a couple months while he was in the program, and we tried to coordinate with people in Pakistan uh, or to get ideas of what he could do when he was there and then report back to us how those things had worked. I think at one end, or the extreme end of the spectrum, we had someone who came into our program who was a very staunch uh, Catholic who believed she was demonically possessed and wanted an exorcism, and we sought out a priest uh, who understood mental health issues and was willing to help us with that, and I don't know, excuse me, to what extent his exorcism went, uh, but performed uh, some ceremony with her, and she actually improved for a couple months afterwards. Yeah, so um, Ryan is um, pointing out that they're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about uh, cultural humility on webinar two. It's definitely a conversation that we have almost constantly within our program. Um, we have, um, we've integrated uh, cultural elements into all of our practice guidelines, and I, you know, I think we're still kind of coming to understand um, the full scope of, of the significance of it. I mean, it certainly affects everything from, you know, whether people access your program, you know, whether they can relate to what you're having, what you're offering, whether you do good or harm. Um, and, you know, ha having folks on your team who are reflective of your local community is very helpful. Um, and also thinking in terms of youth culture and not just um, kind of various Kind of folks from different parts of the world and that kind of thing, but you know, also the youth themselves um, bring their own kind of cultural elements. And there, there was one question about um, what kind of interpreter are you using for your case? Um, Alexa asked that. Um, I assume that was kind of in response to something that Neil had said earlier. Mm -hmm. 
And I see that as a, a fabulous segue into talking about community resources. Um, we had a client who graduated a couple years back who was um, Tibetan. And it's a very small community here in town, and our cultural expert for that was actually the interpreter that we brought in to serve. Uh, we always try to use third-party interpretation. I think at a uh, general rule in mental health, if you try to use uh, a family member who speaks English well, um, there's so many subjective issues and filters and interpretations that happen during that interpretation. Um, you just don't want to go there unless you absolutely have to. So we try to get face-to-face -face services. We have two professional um, multilingual interpretive, interpreter agencies in Portland. Uh, one primarily phone-based, so if we can't get the face-to-face -face interpreter, uh, we're blessed in that we can call up this agency. We have a, a, contact, or a uh, account number, and within three minutes, we'll have someone on the line to do phone interpretation. Um, and to remind everyone, although you probably already know this, whenever I start working with this third-party interpreter, whoever they may be, I request that they um, translate directly and exactly what the person is saying, <clears throat> excuse me, and not to try to make sense of what the person is saying, because if the person has a level of disorganization, I would want to know that. Uh, for example, the uh, gentleman from Saudi Arabia I mentioned a few minutes ago is quite disorganized, and I uh, sometimes with one interpreter recently had to remind them, please tell me exactly what he was saying, and the interpreter sometimes would say, I cannot make sense of what he's saying. Um, and that was very helpful in and of itself. So I'm sorry to ramble from your question, but more directly, uh, we try to, get again, use face-to-face -face interpreters, phone interpreters, if face-to-face -face is not possible, with the final option being a family member or friend. Yeah, yeah, I think that there. Are, this is we've identified a couple of issues that could easily be um, webinars in and of themselves, and and are deserving of a great deal more conversation. Yeah, there are lots of issues around um, interpretation. We had, you know, I've had an issue with um, a Ukrainian um, individual um, complaining about the interpreters who were available because you know, the interpretation was happening in Russian and and um, feeling like they were being <laughs> persecuted by the in interpreters. Um, you know, so there are kind of issues of oppression. You know, we have a lot of, um, a lot of folks who come from uh, Mexico and Latin American countries whose first language is not Spanish um, and don't even speak Spanish well. And so you know, there are times where um, you have to come up with interpreters for indigenous languages. And um, so it's very, it's very challenging. Um, so um, Alexa was saying, um, I'm a licensed clinician and certified interpreter. Literal translation is only helpful when, as you mentioned, client's presentation is, is disorganized. There are many important and sensitive aspects of interpreting. So Alexa, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And you know, one of the things that uh, we really encourage um, within ESA, and I think this is probably um, hopefully going to be a cultural thing generally as we develop our, our kind of national networks around early psychosis, is that people bring um, various levels of um, expertise and knowledge that um, they contribute. And so we encourage people to um, share you know, resources, guidelines, um, best practices that they think should be integrated that maybe aren't explicitly addressed um, in what they're seeing. Um, and you know, one, of the, one of the things that's the, the way the we approach things within ESA is that we don't start off with the assumption that we have all of the best practices fully assembled and you know, we're just ready to go with them. Um, we're trying to continue to learn and evolve. And I, I think um, the cultural issues as well as the rural service area are both um, areas where you know, we're actively working to improve and evolve. So I really appreciate you guys bringing up these issues and, and I think you'll be able to help us as well. Um, Okay, so do you recommend any technology-based therapy for working with this um, population? Oh, gosh, that was a, I was thinking more of the age group. Um, so, you know, again, um, webinar two is going to be um, talking a lot about the um, actual um, kind of technology that we do use. Um, we, within our practice guidelines, we 
we encourage people to think about how to use technology. We're, you know, we require our teams to be able to text. Um, I say that although there are still teams that can't, but we keep pushing that, and most of the programs have been able to figure it out. Because uh, you know, folks in this age group often don't talk on the phone anymore; <laughs> they they only text. You know, and so if you don't do that, you you won't have um, communication. Um, we've taken referrals via Facebook. Uh, we have uh, we have social social media um, on with Tumblr, um, uh, Facebook, um, Twitter. Um, I don't know that we use it totally. Well, I, I think we could still improve our, our use of it. Um, we're still figuring it out. Um, we there are a number of technologies being developed. I know our, our Lane County program is involved in a, a randomized control trial doing uh, computer-based um, cognitive behavioral therapy with folks coming out of the hospital, and they're seeing some really interesting results with that. Um, there are also some kind of smartphone-based technologies being used. And of course, also uh, cognitive enhancement therapy is um, now really being recognized as an evidence-based practice pretty broadly. And it's all computer-based as well, um, helping people to focus in on some of those underlying cognitive deficits that tend to get missed, like you know, working memory and processing speed. Um, so anyway, that's it's it's really an evolving area, um, and so I suspect, you know, there's even even a couple of years from now there will be a lot more available to tap into in that way. Um, we're we're looking right now at trying to develop some additional um, decision support technology for folks that's peer oriented, um, and I know you know Common Ground has has done quite quite a bit with that as well, and that was integrated at some level into the, the RAISE model. Um, so yeah, do, do we recommend any te technology-based therapy? You know, definitely the cognitive enhancement therapy is, um, is pr seems to be pretty effective. Um, and again, I would bring that question to webinar two and to Ryan, unless Ryan wants to say something at, at this stage. Um, it's a, that's a great precursor to the next conversation. Anybody so, want to add anything to that? I, I would add, and it might uh, dovetail with a question Alexa just asked, uh, who and how do you maintain those technical interfaces? How do you deal with confidentiality? At least the second part of that question, I did a little project last year looking into um, social media and mental health treatment. and. If you're going to incorporate uh, the use of social media into your program, make sure you have very good policies and talk to your IT folks. Uh, the two biggest, easiest examples I can give you is number one, texts are not kept confidential. There are certain programs you can buy and put on your smartphones that will make the texts confidential. Um, but that involves obviously some financial investment and some training. And the second issue is how do you document texts? Because you can't print them without a lot of effort. So again, you really need to think through these things if you're going to implement it. But I echo what Tamara says, this population is very immersed in social media, so you've got to dive in there with them. Yeah, I, we can, you know, this is, again, the kind of question where um, you know, we may be able to identify a program for you that's doing it pretty well and, and provide some kind of template um, policies and procedures that people have developed around this. Um, I know generally, f for the use of text specifically, uh, people have um, had a, a, a release form up front that people sign that kind of acknowledges the level of protection. And then there are certain things that they may or may not uh, communicate about by that medium. Um, you know, so they may be talking more about kind of when they're going to get together versus you know, their innermost thoughts. Um, but again, this is a really good one for webinar two. Uh, so we're, we're keeping a list of things for Ryan to, to delve into and, and for us to continue to delve into on, on our next calls. Um, and I'll just throw out that on our Multnomah County team, we do have releases up front. And I'll see if I can get copies of those to share with people who are interested. Great. Thank you. 
And, and um, if it's being done in Multnomah County, um, I can tell you it's been very well vetted <laughs> by attorneys. Because <laughs> they're, they're extremely, um, extremely conservative. Um, okay, so Ming um, is asking, Utah has a juvenile competency program which has identified some young people with early psychosis committing crimes. What are your experience in collaborating with juvenile or adult competency programs or forensic evaluators? Um, well, I know for sure that that happens quite frequently. Um, Neil, you want to? talk about that? Okay. Yeah, um, we only have, or I should say, I only have limited experience collaborating with juvenile uh, uh, forensic programs. I've got to say it hasn't been a positive experience, and I don't want to make a blanket statement for all people working in that system. I think we just had some unique people involved in those cases. Um, and what didn't work out is they tended to excuse the person from uh, consequences, basically, because they were mentally ill and they needed support, whereas we had the contention, you know, well, let me back up a step. Part of their aversion to having the person suffer consequences was to try to get all the charges dropped. Um, and from our perspective, were there charges in place that actually gave more leverage as far as not only enticing the person to want to get some mental health treatment, potentially through a mental health court after the age of 18, uh, but also some interface to work with the person with. Once the legal charges disappeared, they lost any motivation to work with us. Again, I don't want to make a blanket statement for all juvenile justice, but that one case just sort of soured. As far as the adult system goes, Multnomah County actually has a forensic diversion team whose job is specifically to work, to people, work with people who are incarcerated in the Multnomah County system due to symptoms of their mental illness and try to hook them up with treatment um, you know, as a way to either minimize their charges or minimize their legal involvement. And that team works very well, and I've had fabulous uh, experiences with them. Um, I, I guess it's always that balancing act that I think the juvenile people I alluded to went a, too, a little too far with. You don't want the people to suffer if, you know, legal consequences, if it truly is stemming from mental illness. But in my opinion, you also don't want to just let them off the hook, quote unquote, because they're mentally ill. It's not a mutually exclusive issue. And just to jump in, and this is Nev, again, it's going to vary so much what local resources are available in different parts of the country. So you might have in your area a really high quality youth or pay or um, adult um, mental health court system. You might have really high quality diversion programs. Um, other types of alternatives, really high quality youth reentry programs for youth who have already been justice involved. So depending on where you are, um, I think being able to tap into those resources and create good collaborative working relationships can be really powerful, but you know, it's, it's just going to be very, very contingent on the, the context and specifics of where you are in the country and how many of those types of resources are available and what the people involved are like. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. There are lots of different resources and layouts to the land. I, I think also it, it speaks to the importance of the uh, local team really thinking about what works well for them. Um, and uh, you know, doing some outreach and, and providing some training with folks about um, what they think works well, um, you know, and also when there are those kinds of partners involved, um, reaching out and, and developing a collaborative approach with them so that um, you know, people are as much on the same page as, as possible. You, you are going to see a lot of legal involvement. Um, about 20% of the people coming into our program have had some kind of legal involvement already. Um, you know, and again, um, Ryan um, on the call next time um, you know, is really quite an expert on this, uh, having provided both um, supervision and consultation as well as um, having gone through this directly himself on numerous occasions. And you know, sometimes having that you know, the experience of helping people get work their way out of trouble um, can be very um, positive. Um, but you know, ultimately, we are shooting for having um, having a, 
a voluntary program. We really don't want people in the program involuntarily because of exactly what Neil just said, that you know, if they are in the program involuntarily, um, they're likely to want to leave as quickly as possible, and we, we really want them to, to make the choice to be in the program. Um, so I know Ryan is actually on the call, um, and I know that he had had a little bit of experience with an echo previously, but um, Ryan, is there anything that you would like to share? I, I think we're probably okay to speak. No, I think okay. you answered the, the questions well. I mean, it, it does vary based on your individual legal system and where you are. I know I've had very positive experiences working with both the adult legal system and the uh, juvenile system in terms of transporting clients to assessments, being allowed in to see clients um, for assessments, and even engaging in treatment while, while individuals were either inca incarcerated or, or under, under probation. So yeah, I think it's it's definitely an area that we we def we engage in, you know. And I sometimes, you know, to speak to kind of Neil's souring experience. I mean, I think a lot about sometimes the motivational interviewing that we do with clients needs to be worked with on our juvenile systems as well. Um, so that's that's kind of how we approach it, kind of the, the more of a systems kind of approach to uh, to engaging both the individual and the system to, to see how they both could benefit from the individual engaging in treatment. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, so, yeah, so it's good to know kind of what's on people's minds because we can continue to um, include this kind of material in the, the upcoming webinars as well as maybe think about developing some additional resources for folks. Um, there's a question about, um, can you describe how well you've done identifying and engaging youth as peer supports and peer mentors? Um, you know, I th this is an area that has um, evolved into a major focus um, for ESA generally, and I think it depends um, quite a bit on which local community you're talking about. You know, again, we do have a whole section on uh, peer support in our practice guidelines, and um, we focus quite a bit not only on peer support but also on participatory decision making. So we're um, really encouraging programs to include uh, program participants and graduates on their hiring committees. Um, on their governance boards, um, really in, in all aspects of, of decision making. Um, maybe, Neil, you could speak a little bit about, um, you guys just recently hired a full-time peer support specialist and kind of what, how, how that has changed the dynamic within your team. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we hired in our peer support person six, eight months ago, I think. Um, it's had a, a couple of changes in the team. Number one, we've become very cognizant of the language we use during our meetings and when we're talking about people, and just recognizing that even though none of us think pejoratively, obviously, about the people we're working with, there's a lot of pejorative language that's sort of built into our system that we're trying to move away from. And that might not just even be talking about clients, but just talking about things in general, saying, wow, I'm really having a crazy day. And our peer support specialist will sometimes call us on that, well, what do you mean by crazy? The other area where I think she has been incredibly helpful is um, getting information from the people we're working with that they don't want to tell a professional. Um, and this usually boils down into two areas, uh, symptoms getting worse or substance abuse that either we don't know about or it's escalating. Um, and she does a fabulous job of not only obtaining that information, but saying, you know, I'd like to share this in a way that you're comfortable with the rest of the team, uh, do you want me to do that? Should you do that? How are we going to do that? And it just expands your knowledge base and your interventions incredibly. Is she a youth person or older, or what? How did she is uh, in her mid twenties, so she's slightly older than most of the clients we're working with. Okay, and she did. Did she go through a similar program, or she came from a different direction? came from a different direction. She used to work uh, in social services, actually, I believe as a housing coordinator. Oh, cool. 
Um, one of the things that we found is that people who graduate from ESA um, are often very, very interested in playing peer support roles. So um, we have quite a few people who have graduated who have gone on to um, to go through peer support training uh, with Youth Move um, or one of the other providers of, of training. Um, and then also, you know, we have a, a statewide young adult leadership council. Uh, that's made up of folks who have graduated from all over the state. And one of their primary focuses is, is on trying to um, provide ways of welcoming folks who are new to the program, um, creating avenues for outreach, um, and, and a continual long-term relationship that's available to people so that they can, they can make meaning out of their experience and, and develop um, kind of a positive network for each other. Um, we had actually, when we created that group, um, it, we had been thinking about what our state level governance needed to look like. And in our design discussions, everyone had come to the conclusion that first we really needed the young adults um, kind of setting a direction, and then the governance should be structured around their perspective. So um, it, we're, we're really aiming to. Um, to integrate the perspective of the folks who are serving at the, the most meaningful possible level. Um, and again, it's an area where I feel like we're just really um, learning. You know, I feel like we're, we're taking baby steps, steps at a lot of levels. So um, it's an area where I know um, there are folks on the call who I'm sure have had m more extensive experience than we have and may want to share some resources for the whole network that we could then send out to everyone. Um, I've seen another question about the uh, mental health block grant. Just, yeah, go ahead. Tamara, Sorry. just to go jump ahead. in really quickly, that there mm -hmm. are a lot of, there are a lot, I mean, if you look internationally, there's a lot of different models within early intervention settings specifically um, where different types of peers have been incorporated in different ways. So there's definitely like many, many ways of going about it. The evidence base in terms of the research that's gone on and also actually specific trainings um, for youth peer specialists are very, very underdeveloped nationally across the U.S. and, and internationally. Um, so I mean, I think it's a really exciting developing area in which there's still a lot to do and a lot of um, possibilities. In the U.K., um, one of the NHS trusts that run an early intervention program, they have a former service user who's still sort of a young adult in a broader sense who has research training who now works across the board on program development, quality improvement, research and evaluation. And so, you know, given the relative newness of early intervention programs in the U.S., I mean, one hope is that, you know, these youth who are in programs now are going to be graduating, are going to be developing more skills, and ultimately they may be able to populate programs across the board as social workers, as case managers, as counselors, so people who have had that lived experience as well as whatever subsequent professional training. Um, so I think that's something to just, to just orient towards, not even necessarily as just a set-aside peer support team, but just to try to get people involved, to try to hire for positions, um, which starts to, I think, just you know, make the change that, that can go on more, more pervasive throughout the, you know, particular program. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, you know, as, as the programs evolve, you'll have graduates who are, are playing all these different roles. Um, you know, we have people who are out there in the emergency rooms and the admissions offices and the colleges and all over the place. And so um, it, it does really change the, the nature of the, the kind of playing field that people are entering. Um, so the kind of shifting gears, um, Bill um, asked, can anyone speak to how they're implementing the 5% mental health block grant set aside in their state? So this is really a question for the folks on the call. So um, this is Ken Minkoff. I don't know all the details about this. Um, I'm on the phone representing um, 
a project that I'm involved in in Vermont called the Vermont Cooperative for Practice Improvement and Innovation, uh, VCPI for short. Uh, it's kind of an interesting um, entity that, that uh, has been spawned by the department uh, with the goal of ultimately creating a sustained co-op for practice improvement that's kind of jointly owned and managed by all the potential participants, providers of all different kinds and the different state departments so that it's more of a top-down, bottom-up, sideways quality improvement activity. Um, and we've been, the department has some block grants set aside uh, for the FEP and they have just added it in to our funding pot um, so that we can be responsible for identifying uh, best practices for first episode psychosis and then working through the co-op to figure out what and how to implement and disseminate across the state, which, you know, as you know, is um, it, it, it's rural and it's diverse in the sense that Vermont is diverse, even though from other perspectives, Vermont looks pretty undiverse. But inside Vermont, each community is its own unique entity, so everything has to be figured out in a decentralized way. So that's why we're kind of jumping in on a learning community. And um, you know, I, I think it's kind of a clever way to use the block grants to kind of try to stimulate some change. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to share? I see that Ming is typing from Utah. So uh, Ming wrote, in Utah, the state kept some funds for training and social marketing activities. And with the rest of the funds, we'll contract with the community mental health center to pilot FEP. I know that the um, uh, feds are encouraging people to set up at least one pilot site. Um, and of course, they have the uh, raised materials that they've made available to help provide support to people. Um, I don't know if, are there other states? Um, or uh, Ming is, is uh, typing a little more. I think she can't speak for some reason. Uh, okay. Well. Um, anyway, is there is there any other? Somebody else from another state who wants to share what you're doing? It seems like the dollar amount that's available is relatively small. Um, so everybody has to be um, very strategic about how they're, um, how they're going about it. Um, this might actually be a good area for us to do a little follow-up with people on um, prior to our final call. We might do a little survey of people just to see um, kind of you know, because I know we have people representing all kinds of different um, different states. Um, okay, so uh, Ming says we use the OnTrack USA tool to determine which site is feasible to pilot based on the number of people and funds needed for implementation. Yeah, so uh, part of it has to do with just the um, kind of whether you have enough critical mass. And I know in in Utah that's definitely <laughs> consideration. Um, you know. So again, that comes that really does um, lead to some interesting discussions about all the people who don't live in Multnomah County. So let's see. Okay, so um, maybe we could. I know that um, people were muted um, on their computers because they were getting a lot of echoes. Um, but I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to ask or to, to share the information. 
I know we have other states represented. Um, uh, Washington, Nevada, Ohio, Youth Move, National, Idaho, uh, Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, Missouri, Illinois. Anybody else want to share? Or it may just be that people don't yet know the answer to that question. <laughs> that might be why they're on the line. So I, I do know that uh, there is um, a national, uh, an, an attempt to start pulling people together nationally to uh, create um, more coordination across states, and um, you know, for those of you who are, are part of these webinars, um, you know, we can definitely try to facilitate uh, sharing so that people know what other folks are doing. So I don't know um, if there are any other things people want to share. Let's see, we have uh, Cassie. Polidos, uh, Jamie Roberts, Jen, Jewel, a bunch of different folks on the line. Anybody who would like to share what you guys are doing? Okay. So hearing none, what we might do is um, just to do like a little survey or something and see if we can identify those collaborative opportunities. Uh, there's there's a fair amount of guidance that came along with the 5% set aside, and I know f folks are involved in planning. Um, and I'm sure that there are some folks who are involved in these conversations partly because they're just starting their planning process. So it's uh, noon. It's been an hour. We have um, up to another 29 minutes available. Um, are there any other questions that people have or things that they'd like to share, resources that you think are important? Have, have people visited any of the sites that we encouraged you to visit after the first one and uh, come up with any questions or things they'd like to share with the rest of the group? Maybe we could just do a quick check-in. You guys are still hearing us, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, Ming was asking, uh, what's the biggest barrier you've encountered in implementing the model? Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I mean, it, the model, the Doing first episode work immediately requires you to do things differently from day one. I mean, you have to, you really have to kind of flip a lot of the cultural and systemic assumptions on their head. Um, so it's it's challenging um, no matter what direction you look. I mean, the, the financing is the challenge. The um, you, you have to have just really, really committed leadership to to make it work, um, but it's exciting enough and has enough momentum behind it that it it also kind of drives you to keep going. Um, I think the issues that you guys have identified on the call, um, the rural issues, the cultural, um, you know, how do you fully integrate um, peer support, those actually are the areas that we are um, the most focused on right now in terms of, of really um, trying to develop our program further. Um, so, you know, I think um, you know, when you ask what's the biggest barrier you've encountered, um, the, 
the thing that I think is probably the most challenging comes down to a, a basic issue of, of leadership, that in agencies that don't have strong clinical supervision or where their, um, their leadership is, is not quite as, um, as focused, um, those programs struggle. Um, and we've, we've really found that consistently, that programs ha that have really good, solid clinical leadership, a good connection back to their senior management, that, that between them and us, you know, we're able to work through pretty much every issue that they come up with. And, you know, they deal with a lot of different kinds of challenges. Um, but um, it really comes down to that solid supervision and that solid level of, of agency commitment at the leadership level. If you don't have that, it's, it's not going to work. Um, but if you do have that, there's, there's not really any barrier that you can't work your way through. And this is Neil again. Or go ahead, Ness. Oh, well, uh, yeah, well, okay, I'll just go ahead and jump in. I mean, I was going to speak in this case more from the perspective actually of a service user, in my case, former service user of EIP services. But, um, you know, now as, as, as somebody who when I encounter a new program, um, I'm, I'm very much thinking from that perspective. And I guess the point I would want to make is that there is a huge difference between different programs and different models across the U.S. So it's, from my perspective, I guess I'd say it's not just a matter of, of implementing a model, but actually implementing it well, implementing it in a really progressive way, which is a lot harder than maybe just having certain services available. Um, and I definitely have encountered in certain parts of the country programs that, that I find kind of, kind of scary in terms of um, how just a certain way of understanding psychosis, a certain very particular relatively conservative way of doing things, of prioritizing certain types of services. Um, and, and that's how it is, not very responsive to um, the young people involved and maybe not very um, interested even in incorporating peers. So I guess I just want to make the point that I see this like big diversity and I'm you know, incredibly committed to um, promoting programs like ESA um, but not, not every program is doing things that well. And so to me, yeah, just emphasizing that that's a challenge, that's something to really think about. And I would throw in from the point of a clinician, I mean, there's certainly barriers that are, you know, universal to working in this field. I think the unique ones that somewhat stunned me when I started working with our ESA program essentially boiled down to people buying into the model that recovery is not possible. Uh, we recently admitted some to the program a few months ago whose mother uh, has been diagnosed with schizophrenia and apparently is very uh, poorly functioning, uh, uses emergency rooms quite often, uh, is jailed quite a lot of times. Um, and after he had a psychotic episode, came up to Portland to live with mom and stepdad. I'm sorry, uh, dad and stepmom. Um, and they had worked with him for a couple months saying, you know, you don't want to become like your mother, you need to take medications the rest of your life and so forth. And they got very angry with me at the first appointment when I said, well, there's a chance we can try to lower or even get you off medications in the future. Let's give it six months and see what happens. Um, and I'd say the other place, place that shows up very often is with the clients themselves. When we talk to them about getting work, their answer sometimes is, well, I've been diagnosed with a psychotic episode, so I guess I should apply for disability. And it, it amazes me how hard it is to fight that. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. In fact, our, um, our Young Adult Leadership Council did a skit for us at our, our last um, conference where they, um, they started out, um, you know, doing kind of a, you know, here's how it can go and here's, you know, kind of, kind of contrasting, you know, what they'd like to see versus what could happen. And in the what could happen scenario, they had somebody kind of looking up on the Internet, you know, what um, psychosis and schizophrenia were. And, and um, interestingly, the first, if you do a, a search on Google, the very first line that you get, I believe it's from the National Institute of Mental Health, and it says, you know, schizophrenia is a chronic and severe disabling condition or something like that, you know. And um, our, our leadership council actually has taken on the goal of changing that sentence because uh, that's the first, pe first thing people see. So there is a lot of cultural 
um, misinformation out there or, or negativity. So that's a really important point. Um, also, another in terms of barriers or challenges, um, I think because these programs are constructed generally as shorter-term transition programs, you know, thinking about what happens after people leave the program is really important. And you know, I've really begun to think um, in terms of program development that extends out, you know, five even ten years for folks. And we have a, um, a pilot we've been doing with our state vocational rehabilitation office that opens up services in some of our counties up to the age of 30 for vocational support. Because what we've, what we've observed is that people um, often, um, they, they do really well um, after they've left the program, but sometimes they can get stuck vocationally. Um, and the, the types of evidence-based supports that we offer are not as readily available to people after they leave. You know, so really thinking about that whole system and you know, do people continue to have access to these, these types of services after uh, is really, really um, important to be considering. So. I see that we have, uh, that Miriam is, is typing. Um, I, I apologize if there are folks who have tried to speak and for whatever reason are, are muted. Um, you know, we did provide our email addresses in the last uh, webinar and you know, I'm sure we'll probably have some follow-up conversations. And then we'll have two more of these calls as well. Okay, um, could you talk a little bit about outcomes in your program? Um, yeah, so we track, uh, you know, we, we track a number of indicators uh, from the time people first come to us to the time they leave. Um, we definitely see improvements. One area in particular is um, in hospitalizations. Um, one of the things that makes these programs so easy to sell is that uh, a really large percentage of people, often in a community it may be as high as 60 percent, um, are hospitalized um, almost immediately after they develop psychosis for the first time, and they they are at significant risk of rehospitalization if they're not engaged in ongoing services. Um, so we've been able to um, document um, you know, a decrease, a significant decrease in hospitalizations um, from the time they come in the program. Um, the last time I looked at it, it was um, we had across our state, 40% uh, of the people coming into our program had been hospitalized within the three months prior to entry, um, and then that goes down to 10% in the second in the, the first quarter and then um, continues to decline uh, throughout their time in the program. Um, you know, it, 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 there's still, you know, a lot of research to be done about that. Um, you know, we have a lot of people um, who, about 20% of the people who come into our program actually move and are discharged because they move. Um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at is, um, you know, what happens when people leave, um, not everyone makes it through the full period in the program, you know, so we're really trying to evaluate what that means. Um, we, see, um, we see improvements in um, people's um, employment and uh, vocational outcomes that's um, kind of at a marginal level, not as high as we'd like, um, it's about, uh, 60% are either working in, or in school at the time that they leave. Um, we don't track whether they actually have a vocational goal, so I suspect that probably most of them do. Um, we, we also track uh, whether people go on disability, and it's definitely the minority of people who go on disability by the time they leave our program. Um, whether they Stay off of disability is another question and something that you know, we're hoping to construct a, a really long-term kind of study to focus on. Um, so, you know, some of the, depending on what, uh, you know, what program you look at and who the population is, you know, there have been some really kind of astounding um, uh, results related to employment, like uh, Keith Nuchterlane uh, did a study a while ago where they had uh, some really, really impressive outcomes. Um, and you know, I will say that uh, we're 
at least for myself personally, I'm I'm generally not satisfied with um, you know with the outcomes that we get. You know, I feel like we still really need to keep working at it and improving. Um, but I'm happy to share you know, some of that data with folks, and also the um, I can give you um, kind of the outcome indicators that we've been tracking over time as you think about how you construct your system as well. So let's see, and Miriam is typing again. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, other questions? We have uh, 15 minutes left, so doesn't have to be a well-formulated question. Also, if you're doing something cool in your state that you want to share or you know of a good resource, I know Youth Move National um, was signed up for the call, and um, they're an amazing resource and have been a, a really great partner for us in Oregon. Um, talk about uh, technology interfaces. That's an organization that has um, you know, moved beyond Google Glasses, um, yeah, which I Still, I'm still getting used to. Martin Rafferty from Youth Move showed up wearing uh, Google glasses at the last meeting I was at. And we had a long conversation about whether we were all being filmed. And, you know. <laughs> but he didn't seem to be uncomfortable with it at all. <laughs> so. Um, so I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, I suppose we could end the call early, um, but the last time I tried ending the call thinking we were out of questions, people all of a sudden started asking questions. So <laughs> Ryan is typing and Jen is typing, okay. <laughs> We have somebody, a couple of typers, typists. Jen, uh, would you repeat the website recommendations from call one? Um, I can actually forward you um, a copy of the, um, the webinar. The last slide had the website recommendations on it. Um, we have our own website, which is uh, www.esacommunity.org, um, and that has um, a provider resources section on it um, that has uh, a lot of different forms. It has our practice guidelines. Um, Ryan, oh, thank you. Ryan wants us, everybody to follow us on Facebook. <laughs> He's aiming for a thousand, a thousand followers. So, um, I, and then um, also the list that we provided included the um, connection to um, the raise um, or the guidance that came out from the feds about the federal block grant and um, connecting it back to RAISE. And there were a number of links in that document to um, RAISE Connection, which has all kinds of um, materials that they've produced, and then uh, RAISE Early Treatment Program, which has um, manuals that they've developed that are um, things that you can just implement to, um, well, I mean, obviously it takes a lot of training and structure as well, but it's, it's very, very highly manualized to the point where, you know, you're, you're basically taking somebody through a, a kind of combination of psychoeducation along with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing, similar to illness management and recovery, but focused ex explicitly on the um, first episode. Um, so Ming is asking, is your youth support staff devoted to early intervention program or mental health services in general? Um, 
So um, again, it depends on which program you're talking about. Multnomah County has somebody who's devoted explicitly to um, early psychosis. Um, in some of the smaller communities, um, they have a peer support specialist who, who works with uh, people of all ages. So you know, we have some programs that have a whole uh, transition age youth um, infrastructure that has a lot of peer support. Um, and then others where there's no such structure and there's one peer support specialist for the entire agency. Um, you know, so it's, it's really um, developmental depending on the program and, and where they're at. And also, um, you know, obviously more urban areas have, are, are more easily able to create positions um, and the, the rural areas have to be a little bit more creative. Um, another way to ask the question is, is it critical for the youth staff to have early psychosis experiences? Uh, I, I, that's a good question, um, and I, I suspect there might be multiple opinions on that. Um, I think, you know, again, there's diversity in that. Um, some of the folks who are doing the, playing those roles uh, don't have early psychosis experience, um, and they seem to be able to um, they seem to be able to, to do the job well. Um, I, being a youth and having their own experience, um, whether even though it may not be the same, um, often is pretty transferable. Um, Neil, do you want to, or Nev, or Ryan, you guys want to chime in on that one? Um, this is something that I've, not at the youth level specifically, but that I've um, done research projects and evaluation projects on in terms of general adult settings. And I think people really vary in terms of looking at clients or service users, really vary in terms of their own preferences and perspectives. And I've definitely um, you know, heard, heard people and interviewed people who very strongly think that that psychosis experience is critical in terms of their ability to feel that this person is truly a peer and other people don't care at all, like if they have the same musical taste in common, maybe that's more important. Um, and just, just more broadly in terms of the peer specialist movement, peer specialist positions and training, I think there's a lot of debate about this. You know, what, what, what counts as the sufficient experience to be a quote unquote peer? What would that look like in different settings? Is it important to start looking beyond particular mental health experiences and also looking at um, you know, racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, other types of, you know, components of identity that might um, render somebody sort of more appear to a particular group or a particular service setting. Um, but I do think it's something to think critically about because at the far end, you might get, end up um, employing people to work as peers who have very, very little in terms of shared common experience with the client. And that starts to maybe become more problematic if the claim is that these people are our peers, our peers to the client. So that's just my, my kind of general perspective. Mm -hmm. I think as far as having early psychosis experience, um, there aren't that many people at the stage who have had um, the kind of support where available that they were part of an early psychosis program. Um, you know, we, we involved people from the beginning who had a lot of lived experience, you know, who were pretty far, um, you know, like t um, in their 40s and 50s and uh, were extremely helpful to us in understanding how people um, managed to get, pull their recoveries together. You know, we, we brought in um, speakers, you know, we brought in Mo Armstrong and, you know, folks like that. Um, and they were uh, really effective and really helpful. We, we used a lot of the recovery literature, you know, um, the articles that people have written, you know, Mary Ellen Copeland's work, Pat Deegan's work. Um, so those are folks who are not specifically speaking about early psychosis, but who have a lot of really relevant experience. I, the experience of psychosis itself um, is, you know, like Nev was saying, is, is um, somewhat different um, than other forms of mental illness, and so it's helpful for people to have gone through that. Um, 
But also, you know, the qualities of the person are really important. They need to be pretty non-judgmental, pretty open to listening, um, recognize that their experience is actually not going to be the same as the majority of the people that they, they meet. Um, you know, it's, it's really um, kind of, you know, it, it's, it's more of a non-judgmental ear than anything else. There is a one little anecdote where you know we had a visitor at one point, and uh, uh, Ryan actually had helped get a, a social group going that you know, had continued even without without Ryan there. Um, and uh, uh, we brought our visitor to this the social group, and they were just they were playing some kind of game or whatever, you know. And he asked uh, he asked one of the participants why the group was important to him, and he said, well. Well, let me put it to you this way. He said, um, he said, um, a while ago I shaved off my eyebrows. And so I came in here and somebody said, hey, what's with the eyebrows, bro? And uh, the response was psychosis. And then the response that he got to that was, oh, OK, cool. Um, so that kind of sums it up, I think. You know, that, that having a place where you can be truly accepted and welcomed is really critical for all of us. And just, just another thing I would add is like, I mean, depending on the person, and that's why maybe just having a lot of a lot of different options available. Um, so I have, have a lot of experience leading peer sharing voices groups. And um, some of them have been much more inclusive of the full experience of psychosis, and others of them have been narrow, more narrowly focused on voices. And I'll get, you know, participants, members of the group, often who are young adults who really just want to talk about voices very specifically, really want to be able to interact and connect with peers who are also voice hearers. And other people who, like again, are interested in a broader range of kind of unusual or different experiences, you know, that would typically be fall under the umbrella of psychosis. So if you're if you're in a setting where you kind of have different types of groups available, different types of peers, then you know ultimately you're probably going to be able to to meet anyone's needs or um, you know make them feel that sense of like sharedness that's so important. Yeah. Well, and I do think that um, you know starting your program off, you know, really thinking about how will people meet other folks who are in recovery, you know, or who have had similar experiences um, from the get-go. You know, how do you make sure that they have a connection? to folks who they can look at and say, even though I'm really struggling right now, uh, there really is hope for where I'm going. Um, you know, even if it means bringing people together across a region or using the internet or whatever, um, you know, one of the things that we hear consistently from folks in our program is that those interactions are absolutely central and often are a real turning point for them in and starting to feel like they can move forward and that there really is hope. Um, and you know, the, the cool thing is that there are, there are loads of people out there with schizophrenia and other forms of illness who, um, who are you know, doing their jobs and playing different roles in the community. So the more you can connect with that broader network and make that you know, an intentional part of your program from day one, the the better off the folks coming into the program are going to be, and and it'll also impact your your culture. So with that, we have um, two minutes left before our official cutoff. Um, it's been really. Uh, Fantastic interacting with everybody. It's a little weird having the silence. It'd be more fun if you were all in the same room. Um, so um, maybe we can achieve that at some point and get everybody in the same room. I, I think there is kind of a movement to make that happen. And, um, last year, uh, we went to the um, International Early Psychosis Association Conference in San Francisco, and the United States turnout was disappointingly low. Um, so we're hoping that the next time uh, that that will not be the case and you guys will all be there and um, yeah, we'll, we'll have like our own U.S. movement going on because uh, I think that that is 
indeed happening. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and say, does anybody have any last minute words? Nev, Neil, Ryan, anyone else? Just to say thank you to everybody. Yeah, likewise, thank you everyone for participating. Yeah. And Ryan says thank you as well. <laughs> so um, really appreciate your time and your energy, and we look forward to learning from you. And feel free to uh, send us questions, and we'll, we'll see you on the upcoming webinars. Um, so take care. Okay. And with that, I'm going to 